Uh, student agency, you know, these words are being thrown around in our education system right now. What is this student agency? What is this uh, uh, modern learning environments? What is it we really need to be doing as teachers as some of it's being mandated to us? And this idea that uh, education is changing and the face of what teachers do, do is changing. So I was having a look at the history of technology and the history of the world really and thinking about uh, some of the eras that we've gone through. And you know we started with, well, not started with, but we went through this industrial age in the world where it was all about industry and mass production and factories. And then uh, the atomic age where in 1917 Rutherford uh, split the atom and it was uh, this atomic energy that started to be produced in the world. And then this idea of the jet age where we went through this, uh, suddenly you could get from one place to another quicker and faster and more efficiently, not necessarily uh, in the 1940s, uh, uh, available for everybody, but uh, the world started to become a, uh, maybe a smaller place because we could get from place to place. Uh, the space age was Sputnik going up into space and this idea that we uh, could uh, explore the universe a little bit more. And then uh, what we uh, typically know ourselves to be in now this information age with the computers, the technology, that information is doubling every, it depends who you talk about, every, every four or five years the information is doubling in the world. So we're in this incredible age where information is at our fingertips. But there's another era that we're moving into and I found this quite fascinating and they call it the infrastructure age. Because actually the technology age, the digital age, uh, we've really gone, in, as far as we're aware, as far as we can go. Uh, we're just enhancing it. If you have an Apple Watch, it's no different to the Apple phone. It's just been repurposed into a uh, different device. It's not anything new that's coming out really in the digital space. So this idea that it's the infrastructure that we're using this digital technology for is where the, the world is heading. So this idea of having automated homes, that you can have solar panels on your house now that will actually generate power so you don't have to be plugged into the grid. In fact, you can be plugging power back into the grid. The self-drive cars, the idea that uh, we have uh, devices that we can wear that are alert and responsive to our own personal needs. So this infrastructure of how we're living is going to be changing and this is where the futurists talk about what's uh, changing in, in the world and in education. But when we look at education, what's the purpose of it? And so when we look at the history of it, it was that, that idea of mass education, that the early century, in the early 1900s, it was like, yes, we can educate the masses, we can get them all together and we can... Uh, teach them how to read and write and teach them about the world because of course we didn't people back then didn't have access to the world The teachers were the only people who'd read the books who knew the information and so this idea of mass education and then uh, Education was set up to uh, Particularly from the English point of view, which is what our education system has been based on to keep the class structure so the haves and the have-nots uh, many of you who went through school cert will know that there was a 50% pass rate and a 50% fail rate in school cert and that was because it was designed on the English system that teach 50% that they're smart, teach 50% that they're not and we can keep people in the factories, we can keep people working on the farms. So it was a mind control uh, mechanism in a way to make sure we could uh, governments, I guess, could control uh, societies. And so you had the class structure being very clearly defined by education. Uh, there was this whole idea of memorization, that people who could memorize and could think quickly and could uh, answer tests and exams were more intelligent and more worthy than people who couldn't. But of course, we now know in the 21st century that much of this is very outdated. However, we're working in a system that uh, holds some of those ideas to be true. And 
Now, of course, in the 21st century, we talk about thinking and how important thinking is for our students. Of course, in 1900s, by goodness, you didn't want children to think. It was to be seen and not heard. But now we truly know, and our children are asking better questions. They're, uh, they're questioning infrastructure. They're questioning the world. Uh, they're coming in with far more intelligence. In fact, if Einstein was here today and we gave him an intelligence test, he would rank in the bottom third today because intelligence keeps changing. I have a good friend, uh, Glenn Capelli, who belongs to the Mensa Society. Not many people get into Mensa, so uh, it's the society where you have to take a test and it's the top intelligent people in the world. And uh, he, uh, Glenn Capelli talks about Mensa standing for, my ego needs some attention. <laughs> uh, you know, I need to know people know that I'm smart and intelligent. However, uh, that test changes every 10 years. He says he's lucky he did it a few decades ago. <laughs> um, but every 10 years they change the test, they make it harder to make sure that, because as, and this makes sense, doesn't it? Think about evolution. Our children are getting smarter. We're getting more intelligent. You want your, your own children should be smarter than you. I know, you're thinking, no, that's not true. <laughs> But evolution should say that every generation is slightly better than the uh, smarter and more intelligent than the generation before as we're developing as human beings. So there's a new word in education that is being thrown around and you might have come across this word, ubiquity or ubiquitous. So please turn to the people next to you. If you don't know them, quickly introduce yourselves. And as intelligent as you look, Tell them what you believe this word means. Now, if you don't know, if you don't know, make it up. <laughs> Look, to be as intelligent as you can, convince them that you actually do know. So, please turn to the person next to you, tell them what does it mean. Ubiquity. begin to finish up. Who believes their partner knows? Well, there's not many hands. <laughs> Maybe we should have added creative to that. Um, <laughs> okay, so ubiquity. Essentially an education means that learning can be any time, any person, any place, any pace. And think about that. We have access to learning everywhere. Learning is not just about being in the classroom anymore. And it used to be. So any time, any person, any place, anywhere, any how, any way. This idea of being ubiquitous, uh, being able to know that education is about the world now. Because we have this access to information at our fingertips. So... As a professional speaker, I travel around the world and I get to speak with some incredible and work with some incredible people. And I ended up at a dinner sitting next to a futurist, Craig Rispin. And Craig is fascinating as a futurist. He just basically sits in his armchair every day and predicts what's going to happen in the future. It'd be a cool job, really. He's making it up, right? High creativity. He's looking at the trends and then he's going, so this is what I think is going to happen. So I'm sitting next to one of the world famous futurists. So I ha have to ask the question, well, what is the future of education? And here's what he tells me. He says, well, he starts quoting another futurist, Thomas Frey. That Thomas Frey says 2 billion jobs will be gone from this planet by 2030. 2 billion jobs. In fact, turn to the person next to you and just tell them, which jobs do you think will be gone in the next 15, 14 years? Which jobs? Oh. 
and thank you. Please call them out, just popcorn style, anywhere in the room. Go. Cleaners. Cleaners. Well, I hope so. Librarians. Librarians, thank you. Industry. Sorry, I missed that one. Service industry. Service industries, thank you. Retail, Retail thank you. Factories. Transport. 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 Banking. Banking, thank you. Super. Supermarket checkout girls. <laughs> Boys. <laughs> <laughs> the, the shelf. Even the guys, who, the girls who put things on the shelves in the supermarket, petrol stations, travel agents, uh, posty. Right? I reckon the New Zealand Postal Service, if you're watching, um, I reckon they're doing the wrong thing to keep their service going. They are cutting the days they're delivering and making it more expensive to send something. That's not the best way to keep your business going, is it? Well, I don't think it is. So. Uh, the future is changing, so uh, 2 billion jobs will be gone. 60% of the jobs, and we've known this for a long time, that your students are going to go into have not been invented yet. We don't know what jobs they're going to go into. Here's another fascinating statistic, that citizens will have to create their own jobs, and the one that astounds me is this one here. 40% of your five-year-olds in your school will have to create their own jobs. They'll need to be self-employed. Now, self-employment takes a whole lot of different skills than it does to be an employee. And of course, the school system was originally set up to be something to create employees. People knew how to turn up on time, to do what they were told, to don't rock the boat, the status quo, work in the factory lines. But that is not the world. So when we're talking about student agency and what that might mean, for our learners, it's really important to think about the world they're going to be in first. So it's not necessarily, and yes, you're still going to need employees, but 40% of these people, of these children in your classroom, are going to have to have different skills to be able to survive in the world. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us as a teacher? It means that the role of the teacher is really changing that it's not just about giving out information anymore, that we have to be all, be all and do all of these things as a classroom teacher. It's more than just teaching. It's become an all-encompassing role of preparing children for the future, and a future, again, that we don't know about. So I saw this, and I loved it. And I borrowed it from Dylan Willem, uh, who said, what is that purpose of school? What do we do when they don't know what to do? What do they do when they're stuck? What do they do when suddenly the answers aren't immediately apparent? This is what we're preparing children for, a world of the unknown, a world of stuckness in a way. And our job is to teach them to be unstuck so that they know how to move forward when they don't know what the next steps are. So how do we do that in a classroom environment? Well, several different ways. Number one, I believe it's about this, getting back to basics. It's about as teachers really understanding that sometimes we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater and going back and truly looking at our own profession and truly exploring this word here, Pedagogy. What does it really mean? What do we really need to do in a classroom to ensure our children can be prepared? What do we really need to stop and think about? So it's about, again, going back and teaching children how to learn, the learning to learn strategies. For 21 years, I've been going into secondary schools teaching students how to study to pass exams. For 21 years, I've been saying, one day, I hope I never have to do this. Because surely by the time they get to secondary school, they should know how learning happens. Surely they should know their own learning style, their own learning process, how uh, they uh, can take in information, how they process information. Different for every child. But what are we doing if we're not preparing them for a world of learning? We need to make sure that making mistakes is a key part of that learning process. That it's okay to make mistakes, but however, what were we punished for in the school system? Making mistakes. 
We were punished for the very thing that allows us to learn. We were punished for getting things wrong. We were punished for stepping outside the line when we were told we had to be here. We were punished for doing things that were creative and different and trying something new. Whether it was overtly or in a, like a stealth mode that, you know, it was like you just felt like it wasn't okay. So we were, we were even punished, many of us in this room, for questioning, for asking the question, why do we need to do this? Which is a question your children are asking more and more, isn't it? Why? What's the authentic content? Why do I need to do this? So, uh, student agency, what does it really mean? This ability for students to um, have that power to act, have that power to get themselves unstuck when they're stuck, to have that power to move themselves forward, to know their own abilities and their strengths, and to be able to help themselves uh, in that challenging situation, to be independent as a learner, as a thinker, as a person, to be able to be self-directed, so to know their next steps, to know what their goals are, and to take increasing responsibility for their learning. To be able to say, hey, I need to do this, here's my ownership of this, and I want to be responsible for this. And notice the uh, key phrase there, increasing responsibility. So we're not saying, off you go, <laughs> and just letting them free. But we're slowly uh, allowing them to be more and more responsible. However, if any of you have ever worked in early childhood, fascinating watching children in the early childhood space, they have student agency. They do all of this without any direction. They come being able to do all of that. So what are we doing to bridge that gap and allow them to carry on doing that? So I think there's some work we need to think about there. So the essential question that I continue to ask teachers around the world is this one. Who are your students becoming because of your teaching and learning? Who are your students becoming? Not what do they know, what can they do, but who are they becoming? because of what you do in a classroom every single day. Now, I've had, I said earlier, the joy and pleasure of working with some incredible people around this planet. And two of the most incredible people I've had the joy and pleasure of working very closely with is Art Costa and Bena Kalik, the founders of the Habits of Mind. There we are in Hawaii at Arts Condo. So very privileged, I know, just... <laughs> Uh, very privileged to be able to, uh, to be there and do that and uh, work with uh, such an incredible, uh, both incredible minds. Art Costa has been uh, fondly called the grandfather of thinking. Um, and he says, less of the grandfather, please. Uh, although he's in his 80s now, still going, still writing, still thinking, still uh, pushing the envelope with education. Probably be well before his time. However, Many of you who know Art Costa and Ben Akalik's work will know that they founded uh, the Habits of Mind or the Thinking Dispositions. Now, because I'm trained in them, I'm very passionate about the Habits of Mind, but I'm not precious about them. What I am precious about is that you are using thinking dispositions. It doesn't have to be the Habits of Mind. It might not be 16 of them but that you are looking at the behaviours of who are your students becoming. But these are the 16 that Art Costa and Ben Akalik really came up across and said, these are the 16 that help people when they're stuck. These are the behaviours that help you when you don't know what to do. Now, I know that's hard to read on the screen, but in your pack you do have uh, a card with them all on there. So you don't have to scribble them down. Uh, so it's in there. So this idea that there are, there are 16... Um, or more dispositions that we want our students to go through. So the key of this is teaching them explicitly, is actually not just hoping that they learn how to persist, not just hoping that they learn how to uh, manage themselves, not just hoping that they learn how to think flexibly or even know how to think, that we explicitly teach. The way we explicitly teach reading and writing and math strategies is exactly the same way we explicitly teach behaviour. 
And one of the best examples I saw of this was in a classroom beginning of the year. You might want to write this one down. Uh, children role modeling. What happens when you're trying to get on with your work and someone's annoying you? And so the teacher brought two desks out the front, two students, had them role model. Okay, this one is trying to work and this one you're to annoy them while they're working. What, what do people do when they annoy? So they brainstorm that and then they, uh, they practice it. Then, then they stop and go, okay, let's brainstorm. What could this person do to stop the annoying behaviour? So they brainstorm a whole lot of strategies. Then they all go off in pairs and they practice. Because that's what you do, isn't it? How many times do you get children practicing lining up? It's not even a life skill. <laughs> right? I've been through hundreds of airports, I tell you. <laughs> many of them have not been through that process. Um, but... Lining up is not a life skill, but we get them to practice and practice and practice and practice. Why aren't we getting them to practice the behaviours that we want them to really know how to do? What do you do when somebody annoys you? How do you stop that? How do you keep concentrating? Uh, so we need to explicitly teach these. To do that, of course, we need a safe environment. We need a safe environment where it's okay for children to make mistakes. It's okay for them to feel that they can say what they want to say. It's okay to disagree with the teacher. It's okay to step out of line. And there's a process to get you back in line. It's okay to learn. It's okay to be able to choose uh, something you're passionate about. And the words at the bottom that I think are very, very important is that we're not saying, off you go, scaffolding. Scaffolding, really important. I've work been working in a school in Melbourne doing model teaching for the students, uh, for the teachers actually, working with the students, teachers watching. And what they wanted to do was put goal setting right through the school. I said, great. They wanted a goal setting model. So I started with the year eights. And we, I did a lesson. What does goal setting look like with year eights? And so then I worked with year sevens, six, five, four, three, two, one, as the teachers watched. And then, and so this is backwards by design and action. And at the end of the two days of me modelling all those lessons, I could see a very clear pathway that they needed to take to get students to the end product of year eight and what it was going to look like. But it didn't mean, so when they're buddy coaching and asking coaching questions of each other in year eight, it doesn't mean that we're asking the year ones to do that. So what are we doing in year one to prepare them for here? So that we're not all doing the same thing. I work in another school actually also in Melbourne, where the students, are the, they have modern learning environments and they're very clear. And your school can make up your own rules around this, but you need to be very clear and think about some of this idea. Then they're, they're very clear. Their model is year one and two, single cell classrooms. Let's get the basics done. Let's get the behaviour. Let's get everything sorted in a single cell. Year three and four, students are um, in an open plan environment but it's not full immersion open plan. But they're preparing them in the open plan environment for year five and six, where it is full immersion, student agency, students in control of their learning. So they have their stepping stones and their scaffolding in place. Really important, something to think about at the beginning of the year and something we'll have time to think about tomorrow. So as we're looking at any kind of dispositional thinking, uh, this idea of persisting, keeping going when you're stuck, being able to find plan B if plan A doesn't work. So at last year's Teachers Matter conference, the wonderful Michael McQueen talked about this new generation, these generational uh, X, Y, Z and alpha generation that are coming through now. But he talks about these generations have been brought up to believe that life is easy. Think about the children in your classrooms. For many of them, they actually don't know what it's like to be in true hardship. Yes, we have poverty in this country. Yes, we have children who um, don't get what they, the basics that they need. And, but as a country, those, we haven't been through the wars and the, uh, the tough times that really uh, were very different times to be growing up in. And so that this idea that they actually believe that life should be easy. 
And what the, that transpires to is they don't know how to do hard. So it's like when it gets hard, they stop. They step back. They say, I don't have to do it. And I love this billboard that was uh, in Lower Hutt. It's on the back of some of the Wellington buses. I don't know if it still is. Check it out if you're in town tonight. To get to easy, you have to go through hard. What a wonderful philosophy in a classroom environment. Tell them it's going to be hard. Tell them it's supposed to be hard because that's how learning happens. As a philosophy and an underlying philosophy, allow them to know that my job is to give you something difficult so that you can work through it so it becomes easy. Learning to walk was difficult. Learning to talk was difficult. Learning to read and write is difficult. And it's supposed to be because that's how you flex the learning muscle. That's how we learn by going through that hard to get to the easy. We need to reframe this idea of failure so that it's okay to make mistakes. I love Facebook's tagline. Work fast, break stuff. <laughs> Basically they're saying we want you to fail fast. We want you to break it and realise it doesn't work so you can fix it. And those of you Facebookers know that sometimes they do things and you go, what? And they fix it real fast because they get that feedback really fast. But they just keep trying new things, trying new things, trying new things, giving it a go. So we need them to know that it's okay to make mistakes. We need them to know that engineers have failure conferences. <laughs> I think this is cool. Imagine coming to a conference and all we talk about is what doesn't work. Imagine if we sat in education in our staff rooms and actually put into the pile, into the middle, everything that doesn't work in education and go, we're not doing that anymore. It doesn't work. How many times do we reproduce in classrooms and in schools the stuff that doesn't work? So the purpose is not to wallow in the doesn't work, but the purpose is to go, okay, it doesn't work, let's move on. Let's find out what does work. So being able to look at those models, I love that idea. Um, it's okay to make mistakes, again, over and over again. An underlying philosophy of student agency is that if you're independent, if you're self-directed, it's okay to actually screw up. It's okay to make a mistake. See, I love this idea of, uh, I was in a classroom and I asked the student, I saw her practicing a spelling activity. And I said to her, can you spell that word? Do you already know how to spell this word? She went, yes. And so here she is in a classroom, independent activity, practicing words she already knows. I asked her this question. What's a word you don't know how to spell? Her whole brain starts to fry. <laughs> but I ask you, turn to the person next to you, what's a word that you don't know how to spell? Go. And please begin to finish up. For some of you, that was an easy question. For me, that's an easy question. It's like most of them, big ones, right? For some of you, that was a really difficult question. Because it's like, I don't know. Because often we don't think about what we can't do. I always, you know, oh, look at all the things I can do. But what can't you do? So I said to this child, what can't you spell? She said, paint. I said, great. How might we spell it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I said, what do you think? She goes, P. A. N. T. I said, how do you know you're right? Oh no. So the little boy beside her <laughs> says, you could go look around the walls. So off she goes, looking for the word paint in the classroom. <laughs> it's a strategy, isn't it? 
comes back and says, I can't find it. Well, how else are you going to know if you're right? I could use my spelling chart, go get it. But what strategies do they have when they don't know what to do? What strategies do your students have to move forward? An underlying philosophy of the modern learning, innovative learning environment so that they can have that student agency. They need to feel very comfortable in that ability of not knowing. In fact, the metaphor that I use at the beginning of the year when I was a teacher, and I encourage you to maybe try this one, it's timely, it's the idea of the monarch butterfly. They're flying around our gardens right now. You may even have a swan plant in your classroom uh, to illustrate this fact. But if you help the butterfly out of the cocoon, it will die. Because it's the struggle that makes it strong. So I talk explicitly to students about it's the struggle that makes you strong. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to leave kids to flounder. It doesn't leave, mean I'm going to leave kids to um, fail and feel like a failure. But I'm going to encourage them that it's the struggle that's the important part. It's the struggle that makes them strong. So I was teaching a lesson and I said to the students, listen, I'm purposely giving you this lesson to and I'm giving you something that's really hard. Because I want to know what do you do when things get hard. Actually, for a while, their own teacher wasn't in the classroom that day as the other teachers were fishbowling and watching. And uh, at some point, I think I had over half the students going off to get a drink of water. Great strategy. Stop and talk to your students at the beginning of the year. What do you do when things are hard? What are your strategies for avoidance? My favourite, I've got two favourites. One boy said, I hide my pencil and I pretend to look for it for five minutes. <laughs> Brilliant! It's just like he knew exactly what he does when things get hard. Another one said, my other favourite, said, I pretend I'm writing by rewriting over what I've already written. <laughs> and when the teacher comes around, I look like I'm thinking. <laughs> they know. At a certain age, they actually know what they do. Um, and uh, they were just so honest. They forgot their teachers were sitting in the back of the room. <laughs> and, uh, but they were just so honest. Um, and this came out of a question from a principal who said, why are so many children going to the toilet? Is there a problem in my school? And I'm like, no. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with bladder control. <laughs> it's avoidance. So what do your children do? So explicitly talking about, you know, the struggle. So I'm in this lesson. I told them it was going to be hard. And I said to the uh, students, off you go. Halfway through, a boy burst into tears. And one of the other boys turns to him and said, it's supposed to be hard. <laughs> the tears stopped and he carried on. <laughs> Have you noticed that? I've noticed a phenomena in my household. My children do this. Mom, I can't. Oh no, it's alright, I found it. <laughs> Mum, how do you... Oh, it's alright, I've worked it out. And sometimes they actually have to verbalise what it is they can't do and what they need to do. And in that time they've verbalised it, it's made it make sense in their brain and they've worked it out. So often when they're verbalising some of this hard stuff to us, it's not because they need us to do anything. We've often thought we need to be the rescuers as teachers. We are very big-hearted and uh, want to rescue, but we don't, sometimes you need to stand back and let them do that little struggle. The biggest lesson teachers get when I do model lessons and with children uh, and giving them something hard is teachers saying at the end, it was really hard not to interfere. It was really hard not to jump in and help that kid. It was really hard to stand back and watch. But I get it now. I so get it. So this idea that we want our students to know where the magic happens and it is outside our comfort zone. I think our job is to take kids outside their comfort zone. In fact, I think our job is to take them to the edge and push them <laughs> with love and support. Because uh, this is where the learning happens, in that magic zone. It's where it really happens, in the uncomfy zone. 
This idea that good learners go through the pit of learning and explicitly teaching children about you're in the pit, it feels difficult. But for me, the ladder to get out of the pit, this ladder that goes in here, the support are these uh, 16 habits of mind or whatever dispositions that you're using. It's the dispositional thinking that helps them be unstuck when we're asking for students to have uh, student agency to be independent, self-directed. So, as I finish up, this idea that <laughs> you can be replaced by a machine, you should be. Anything that can be Googled isn't something you need to be teaching. If they can access it, we don't need to teach it. We need to be teaching the stuff that cannot be Googled, that cannot be accessed. The how-tos, the dispositional uh, ideas, the ability to be contributing creative uh, citizens of the 21st century. Because again, our job is so much bigger than the content. It's not about the content, it's really about uh, these students. So this idea that the modern learning environment is not about the fancy furniture. It's not about the bright colours. It's not about the technology. It's about this ability to be constant learners. And you can have a modern learning environment in a tin shed. It's got nothing to do with the classroom. Don't tell the government because they'll stop building your new classrooms, right? <laughs> but it's got nothing to do with it. It's like, it helps uh, to facilitate the process perhaps, but you can have a modern learning environment in any kind of classroom because it's about the pedagogy. It's about what you think. The world is in our children's hands. The possibility is in our children's hands of what is possible and what's, um, um, uh, what the abilities they can create and what they can do because they have access and our job is to help them with that access. So again, that question, who are your students becoming because of your teaching and learning? Thank you.